Who here would like a key client? Thank you. <laughs> hey, fantastic. We're off to a good start. You know, one of those kind of big showcase kind of marquee clients? Are these the sort of guys that you, you're after? Does that make sense? Who wants more than one? Yes, fantastic. Great stuff. As Hugh said, my name's Neville Tynemouth. I'm a founding director of two trading companies here in the Northeast. And I really struggle when I say this myself now, but I've been involved with sales for about 30 years. I started at six, honest. I'm not that old. Thank you. <laughs> yeah, you're right, you didn't. Um, I've been involved with lots of different organizations and sold to lots of different key clients. I was part of a FTSE 100 telecoms and IT company. And when I first started with them, they gave me 42 clients to look after. And in those 42 clients, probably folks you would have never heard of. Nike, Greggs, Sage, back then it was Eager, and about 38 others, some of which were multi-billion dollar organizations based right the way around the globe. So I've been at the sharp pointy end of dealing with key, uh, key clients. And what I'd like to do today is a little interactive session with you about how you go about winning, securing, maintaining, and developing a key client. Is that okay? Yeah. Are we all awake? Have we all had enough coffee this morning? Yeah. Fantastic. So first things first, what is a key client? I know what a key client means to me, but what does a key client mean to you guys? Is it a household name? Has anybody heard of Pareto's Law? Okay, um, Vilfredo Pareto. I think he was from Wales. He's Italian. Back in about 1906, he made an absolutely startling discovery. And that startling discovery was, it goes as this, 80%, 80% of the peas that he ate in his house came from just 20% of the pea pods in his garden. But he's not particularly well known for that. What he did do, he, he looked at Italian uh, economy and looked at the whole makeup and um, political infrastructure of the country. And he was really quite surprised when he found about 80% of Italy's land was owned by just 20% of the population. And he thought, well, that's us Italians, we're quite quirky, we're quite unusual. And he looked at a few other countries and found not exactly the same numbers, but very, very similar patterns. And fast forward to today's business, and do you know what? Large organizations realize quite often 80% of their revenue comes from 20% of their customers. And the frightening stat, if you want it, about 80% of what you do during the week will generate just 20% of your income. 20% of the time, you're generating your maximum 80% of income. So what on earth has this got to do with a key client? Well, a key client is the significant uh, input to your revenue, to your turnover, or to your profit. That's what I'm looking to do. So I'm looking for a client that's absolutely going to boost what you do. Why do you guys want a key client? Why is a key client important to you? Let's have some ideas. This isn't just me talking, so what, why are you guys? Because a few of you said I definitely want a key client, or more than one. Um, is there a well-known name and you get associated with success? because someone successful has chosen you as a product. Yeah, so reflecting their brand, big name where somebody's heard of it. it, it it's that reflection bit of working with somebody else. That's a really, really important point. Anybody else? Why you want to work with a key client? Uh, security. Security? Okay, tell me a bit more about security. No, if they're, they're sort of a key marquee client, they're probably a big business, you know, they're not going to disappear, they're not going to fall away off the map, they're probably going to pay their bills. They're, they may well, they're probably the kind of client that's going to pick somebody and stick with them, so they'll probably come back and have a repeat trade. I, I like the use of the word probably. Probably going to pay their bill. <laughs> yeah, hopefully they do. They're not always the best payers in the world, in my experience. Some of them can be very, very slow. But actually, there is, there's nothing kind of guaranteed in life. But actually, it's a big bit of security dealing with a big name. Any other reasons why you want to deal with a, a, a large key client? 
I guess they're less likely to go bust. But I'm not sure it's 100%. <laughs> <but> <laughs> just a couple of years ago, you're the big banks. Yeah, it, it, there is no guarantees in life, but yeah, you, know, you, you certainly mitigate some risk if you spread about and you deal with you know, a number of key clients. There's a bit about, it's almost that reflected uh, brand, reflected awareness bit, but what about the PR that goes with it? The PR of winning a big client, would that be quite good? And you quite often get that instant hit of revenue of dealing with somebody. But equally, if you've got a large organization, a key client, you can get lots of ongoing revenues. So you build that relationship over time and you start to think, actually, I'm going to get quite a bit of money over a period of time with them. But we need to be aware of the drawbacks. What are the negatives associated with dealing with some of the big, big, big players, the key clients? I guess it's the other side of the security. If you're just reliant on one big client and yes. they do go bust, then you're in trouble. Eggs in one basket. Yeah. Can be, and we've seen this before. We've done some work with a couple of different clients who've dealt with one major customer and they realise they're extremely exposed. If that customer sneezes, catches a cold, you've got a really big problem. So, yeah. What else? What about the time invested? Yeah, because this isn't going to be a short process, is it? It could be quite a long process getting from where you are now to when you're dealing with a major client. And you have to invest some time. You might have to invest some cash. You might need to do some things slightly differently. And that's quite, you know, do I invest that cash now and what return will I get in the future? What about the emotional investment? Because a lot of folks don't consider this element. What about the emotional bit? Well, actually, this could be really quite hard work. This could be a long journey. There could be lots of knockbacks along the way. I often joke I've had more knockbacks than the average squash ball. But that's the way that business works. You have to work at it a long time to get to a point where you can secure a key client. But as long as you have a really clear idea in your head of why you're trying to achieve this, that's a great place to start from. How about if we start thinking about setting ourselves some goals? A few targets, a few things to get us going. Because there's far more intelligent and well-rounded folks than me that will tell you the power of setting some goals and the power of making these things happen. And we've seen this time and time again where individuals and businesses set themselves a goal and start to move towards it. And actually, you've taken a really great step today by coming along and starting to learn something about winning a key client. Because you're starting that process right now. How do I move towards this? But actually, what are your goals and aspirations in terms of time? For some of you, it could be quite... A quite a short time frame between today, say three months down the line winning that key client. Others, you might be in your infancy now, and it could be 6, 12, 9, 18, 24 months before you get there. But you set yourself a goal and plan this out. There's a customer we work with um, probably about 18 months ago now, and what he found really useful was he noted down all the key clients he wanted to work with. And what he did, he put them in his office on a whiteboard. So every day when he was sat at his desk, he could look up and think, whatever I'm doing right now, does it take me a step closer to these key clients? So in terms of setting yourself some goals and thinking about this, that little visual reminder of where, what you're trying to achieve and what you're aiming for can be extremely powerful. So you've, started, you've shared some stuff with me. I'm looking for engineering companies to start to think. And this might sound like quite a small point, but it's really significant. Uh, we did some work uh, for a, an organization about, I don't know, probably about nine months ago on their whole business strategy. So we did everything from kind of basics to where they want to be. And as part of that, we did a session with the whole group where we got them to um, list down all the key clients they wanted. So we did what trainers do, and we split them up into little groups and said, OK, you know, fill a list and let's get them going. And the group that the MD was in came along, put a flip chart up and said, these are the key clients who are desperate to get in. And another group, one of the, one of the girls from the other group who worked in admin, who answered the phone, went, oh, number three, yeah, my brother-in-law, he's the MD there. Do you want to go and see him? Because I can pick the phone up now and get you in. And the MD was kicking herself because she'd been chasing that client for about 18 months with no success. And she hadn't actually thought about telling others, saying, actually, I need some help here to get in. And one of the things that, I don't know if you've come across the six degrees of separation, 
if you're young and trendy, it's a six degrees of Kevin Bacon these days. Yes, more, more <laughs> nods for more folks. Okay, that makes no sense to me, it does to some. But we're all very, very well connected these days. If you think about the networks you work in, think about how many connections we have in this room. If you all have 100 people on your phone, is that fair, at least 100 people on your phone? Yeah? That's a lot of folks. I'm not going to add up, I can't do maths. That's a lot of connections we've all got. So if you start sharing with your trusted business partners your connections, they'll help you move towards. Does anybody use LinkedIn? Okay, the vast majority. LinkedIn's a really powerful tool for finding people. I like LinkedIn a lot. We do a lot of work on LinkedIn. We help a lot of clients with LinkedIn. But it's a great tool for finding the folks that you want to be in front of. It's amazing if you set yourself a goal and take some small steps towards it, it's amazing how quickly some of these things can happen. It's not always that easy, but I'm going to show you some techniques that will take some shortcuts for you, but set some goals and move towards that. Are you ready? Is your business ready for a key client? And we've seen this happen, where somebody wins an absolutely massive client and then can't service them, can't provide the product or service, doesn't have the backup. So stop and think, you need to do some preparation. Is my business fit for this key client? Are my terms and conditions right? Do I have a customer service setup that will work? Are all my internal processes ready? Do I have an account management plan? How am I going to manage them as a client when they come on board? And we do a lot of work and we often use this expression we call living in your customer's world. Get somebody you trust explicitly, and trust a really big important part of this, to give you some critical feedback on how your organisation appears to a customer. And a nice test is if you can get somebody to go and speak to your current customers and ask for some feedback and say, what do you think of this company, this organisation, this person? And if they're saying, oh, you know what, they're absolutely brilliant to deal with, everything's perfect, it's a good place to start from. If it's, well, do you know what, they're a really nice bunch, really like them a lot, but their invoicing is a nightmare. The complaints procedure is a nightmare. They're the bits that you need to focus on. So are you ready for this key client? Because if you're not, you risk taking the step and losing the customer really, really quickly. This is possibly my favourite quote when it comes to comfort zones. It's by a chap called Neil Donald Walsh. And he said, and I think this is brilliant, life begins at the edge of your comfort zone. So when you've done all your stuff and you're ready, the big bit that will hold you back potentially is you. Because we see this all the time. We see folks who have brilliant products and services. I'm sure some of your products and services are brilliant. But you know what? It's that, well, I'm not quite sure it's ready for, and I'm not quite sure they're ready for us. And do you know what? I'll get onto that. And there's probably other things to do. And it's quite often the business owner's own aspirations or lack of them that will hold them back. And the comfort zone bit is like a big elastic band. As soon as you start moving towards something that's difficult, your comfort zone will pull you back bit by bit by bit. And it's important to recognize that. We do lots of work on behavioural change in selling and actually breaking outside of your comfort zone is simply the best thing you can do. So, where do we go with this? Well, we need to plan and prepare. Yeah? Have you ever been the wrong side of a sales conversation where somebody's come to see you to sell something and not planned and prepared? I've had sales reps come to try and sell me signs of equipment without really knowing what the specifications of the equipment is. And yep. if you tell something to a scientist that, and, then, and then can't back it up with facts, then immediately everything you're saying is completely rubbish. Yes, so credibility goes out the window. Yeah, because I'm not going to believe what he speaks from marketing speak because I don't really care, I want the facts. That's a bit of planning and preparation, understanding the person you're going to go and sell to. LinkedIn's a great source of information. Company website, news streams, whatever you want, go out and find out about these organisations. The slide has a microscope and a telescope. It's a little cheesy, so forgive me. But it's that way I want you to think about your planning. You need to understand with a key client or a sector you're going after, what's the big picture? That's a telescope stuff. What's the big picture? 
Uh, what's the political situation within a particular marketplace? What's the financial situation? Think about, and this might sound really strange, but not many folks think about this. The key client you're going to see, how do they make money? Where does their profit come from? How do they capture customers? What do they, their customers say about them? Because there's a really great insight as to how a business runs and what they do. And it's that level of understanding you need to take into to go and see a key client. Assumptions will really, really mess you up. And this is, I think if there's one really big thing to take away today, it's about the assumptions that you will make along the line. And unfortunately, this trips up 99% of people that we see. There'll be some level of assumption made about going to see a key client. What I'd like to do now is share a model with you. And this is the model that we've developed, we've used over a period of about nine years now. And this is the tool for getting to know, getting to know that key client extraordinarily well. This is a model um, that we built, I say about seven, eight, probably nine years ago now, we've refined and developed and tweaked. This is the model for really understanding a client and really getting underneath their skin. The first S is about a significant issue, pain or change an organization is going through. Yeah. Now this is one that most folks don't stop to consider. What's happening in the organization? What changes are coming up? Because that's where a lot of opportunities come from. So yes, there might be in a five-year agreement with another supplier, but there might be a change coming through. There might be something happening that's made them sit and think, actually, what do we need to do differently? How do we change this? And we can think about things like um, opening a new site is a big change. Moving head office, launching a new product, even downsizing can bring opportunities depending on what the organization does. But what a lot of people fail to understand is actually go in and find out about their clients. Start asking the client, what are your plans going forward? Where are you in the next 12 months? And have you had this before where somebody will come and talk to you and you're quite happy to talk about you when they're showing interest? Understand what changes, issues or pain they are facing. So that's the first S. Where's the significant pain or issue? that your key client faces. A, yes, it's there, fantastic. This is the big scary one. Do they have any cash? Yes, you come across, there's a few folks smiling now and going, oh yes, I've had this before. They love what I do and they had no money. Yes, it's, you had that? Yes, it's painful, isn't it? But, but this is the bit, and a lot of folks are shy about asking this question. Um, the key is knowing when to ask it, okay? If you ask too early, you will absolutely put them off. So as you open the door to their building, you know, you got any cash? Do you have your checkbook out? We're ready. <laughs> yeah, that doesn't work. We tried that. Not an advanced technique you want to apply. But think about how you have an impact. If, and we'll talk about this a little later on, but the trust you build up with a potential key client will allow you to ask this question. Not everybody will give you an answer or a straight answer, but actually if you build a relationship with them and build some trust, you are absolutely in a position to say, can you tell me what your budget looks like for this? Is that a one-off? Is that quarterly? Is it annual? Who manages it? How do you organize that budget? Because one of the things that really surprises me is the fact that not a lot of people understand this question and get to, and that's a real painful bit, sorry. You know, submit my bill and it's not paid do some work, get halfway there, get eight meetings in and suddenly go, oh, we've got no money for this. We're not really comfortable asking about money, but get comfortable because it'll save you an awful lot of time. Purchasing processes is the P. This bit is how an organization buys your product or service. Yeah, so this is a bit about how they actually say so you go from being interested in saying yes to a point where you get an order. If you build brilliant relationships with your clients, if you build that excellent relationship before you move forward, you can negate a lot of issues. Have you, you come across this before where you've got a really good relationship with somebody and something goes wrong 
and you can kind of fix it really easily because you've got a good relationship. You can phone up and say, hey, do you know what? We've cocked up. We've gone wrong here, but let me fix this for you right now. And they'll go, yep, great. I know you. I trust you. Get on with it. With a key client, you're kind of wiping all that slate clean and going, you don't know me. Trust me, we're good at this, but you don't know me yet. So we need to think about how you understand their purchasing process and how you map out who's involved. Because right now you've got a relationship where you can pick the phone up and go, can I have a purchase order for that? Yeah, no problem, I'll just get, hang on, just give me two seconds, there you go. With a key client, it's not always that easy. And unfortunately, I've been in the position where I've done eight, nine, ten months of work, done six, seven meetings, done probably two, three, four million pound contracts, and never gotten back. You know, right up to the point where you go, yeah, God, we're going to go ahead with this, no problem. Yeah, it's coming. And a month down the line, two months, wherever, it's, well, actually, it just didn't ever happen. And what I didn't do, and I do now every single time, is understand their procurement process. Who gives out purchase orders? Who signs this off? And I will say to folks, as I present the contract, just tell me about how this kind of goes through the business. What, you know, who needs to see this? Oh, well, all contracts over a million pound get uh, signed off by the board. Great. And who's normally at your board meetings? Okay. And then you start, well, actually, how well do I know these folks? Do I know them well enough to pick the phone up and have a conversation and go and see and build a relationship with? Because if you think about it, if you're on a board of directors and you get a contract line on your desk and you've never heard of them, never heard of the company, never heard of the individual, and you look at it and go, do I really want to sign this? A million quid's worth of business? I'm not sure. So understand that purchasing process. And the bit that most folks don't realise is even relatively small turnover companies have these huge cottage industries that have sprung up to manage procurement and purchasing. So you need to understand everybody individually because I've seen some really, really weird stuff. Back in my um, telecoms and IT days, yes, it gets signed off by the FD, it gets signed off by the MD. Great, yes, I've got that, I've got that, I've got that. And then Betty on reception has to say yes because she deals with the phones. That's Betty, I've just upset in the way in because, oh, right, I best can have a word with Betty. And it's the little quirks like that that will trip you up when dealing with a key client. Make sure that you get to know everybody exceptionally well. So that's significant issue, pay no change, access to funds, purchasing process. So the last S must be blindingly obvious. It's sleepless nights. Let me ask you the question first and just check I'm not alone. Has, has anybody else had that four in the morning thing? <laughs> folks are, yes, absolutely. That four in the morning, you go, oh, Jesus, I haven't done that yet. And it can be a personal thing or it can be a work-based thing. We go, do you know what? I, I've not kind of, oh, if I don't get that sorted out, I'm, yeah. And you can't get back to sleep and it just goes over and over and over and over and over. That's the bit I need you to understand. And this is the bit, and genuinely, this is the bit that transformed uh, the sales team that I work with. We had a half a billion pound target, which we overachieved. It was this bit that made a significant difference to our selling, getting new key clients on board. Because yes, we understood all the other parts, the significant issue, uh, the change, access to funds, the purchasing process, but it was this bit. So you're dealing with somebody in an organization, you start saying, actually, so what you're saying is you're gonna move to a new site, which involves knocking two sites down and yeah, okay, that's quite a big job and this is the way you purchase it and you've got the budget to put to one side. But, but Susan, specifically for you, how does that have an impact on your job? Well, oh God, you know, if I don't get this move done properly, they've kind of not told me but hinted that I'm out because this, you know, this is a big bit of what we do. If I don't get this right, my job's on the line. All right, okay. So if you think about that bit and really understand what's going to make them work, wake up at four in the morning, that's the bit that you can tap into. The sleepless nights for your potential key clients, the individuals in there, are the bits that you tap into now and say, actually, allow me to help. Because once you understand that personal pain and issue, you have a great way to position what you do. So SAPS is a fantastic tool. We run coaching sessions with teams where we look at major clients and how they go about acquiring them. And we run one-to-one -one coaching sessions where folks just kind of go, not thought about any of this. And that's a model that you can just take and reuse. 
So what sort of job roles, what sort of job titles do we think we need to understand within a purchasing process? The difficult bit is no two organisations are anywhere similar. And that's the hard bit. And they might not have procurement. They might call it something completely different. They might call it finance. There are just a whole different raft of names that crop up. And you just need to stop and ask the questions because everybody has a different way of doing this, a different process. Um, and we haven't got time today, but one of the things we could do if we want to have a bit of a play is to map out what a typical purchasing process might look like. Because you've all probably got different ideas and different thoughts on this. But actually, understanding that from an in individual perspective is really important. Mm -hmm.